welcome. Welcome everybody to this space and uh, the dialogue series on the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP at 50. And today we will celebrate another 50th anniversary, that of the Ramsar Convention on uh, Wetlands. I am delighted to welcome everyone to, to the Zoom room. And uh, we will be starting the conversation with Marta Rojas, the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention in, uh, in a minute, as uh, people are, are joining the dialogue online. Let's begin the conversation. So um, it truly is a pleasure to be here today uh, with, with Marta Rojas, Marta Rojas Urego, the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. This series, UNEP at 50, commemorates the 50th anniversary of the creation of the UN Environment Program and indeed global environmental governance. Uh, many of you have joined us for the previous uh, dialogues in this space. We began with the current executive director of the UN Environment Program, Inger Anderson, in May of uh, this, this year. And then we continued in June with Achim Steiner, the former executive director and currently the administrator of the UN Development Program. In September, we reconvened after the summer break for a dialogue with Wanjira Matai of Kenya on the activism from the outside. And uh, we are now expanding the dialogue uh, to include the conventions, the multilateral environmental agreements, and are delighted to have Marta Rojas with us. And indeed, next, next month, we will be joined by another um, convention, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, former uh, Secretary General, that is uh, John Scanlon. So Marta, welcome, welcome. It's wonderful to have you today um, in this space. Let me introduce you to our audience. Marta Rojas is the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Before joining the convention in 2016, she served as a senior environmental manager and negotiator in Colombia and in several international environmental non-governmental organizations. Marta has over 20 years of experience in conservation and in environmental protection, in humanitarian relief, in gender equality, and she has helped raise the profile of international um, environmental action at the local and the global level. And today, Martha and I continue conversations that we actually, as individuals, did start 20 years ago when I was doing my graduate work and uh, was convening these global environmental governance dialogues um, while I was myself a student. And so Marta, it's wonderful to welcome you here today to reconnect, to restart these dialogues, explore untold stories and reimagine environmental multilateralism. Welcome. Thank you, Maria. It's a real pleasure to join you uh, in this conversation, uh, in this celebration, you know, as we're getting to the 50th anniversary of UNEP and to reconnect with you, as you say, uh, we met uh, a long time ago, I remember, and we have been meeting in different moments in time. So, so it's, it's also a personal pleasure to be having this conversation with you, Maria. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Indeed, the conversations continue and the connections that we make as, uh, as individual, they, they drive us as people, but we also move the institutions that we are part of. And so today, I'd love to start with Marta Rojas, the individual in the institutions. Tell us, who is Marta and how did you get to where you are today? And it's, it's wonderful to reconnect in this space, but please share your personal and professional journey with, uh, with our audience today. Thank you, Maria. So 
I, I, I am Colombian. Uh, I'm also French. Uh, I, I started, I lived, uh, of course, all my, my first part of the, the study life in, in Colombia, and I am a biologist. So I started in science, uh, and biology is a very large uh, domain. So I was wondering what I should do. And well, I did some other studies, but I think that when I had my first job, which was in Inderena, which was the Institute of Natural Resources, which afterwards became the Ministry of Environment, I started to work in the protected areas department, and then I knew this is what I want to do in my life. Uh, so that was the beginning of the journey. And I worked uh, in, in Inderena, and then I, I, I worked with local NGOs, so a lot of work on the ground. Um, and uh, after some additional studies, I, I was appointed director of National Parks of Colombia. And that was a fantastic uh, experience uh, in terms of, of leading uh, the management of all the protected areas of one of the most uh, biodiverse countries in, in the world. So, so that was uh, a, a very important point in my career. Uh, at the same time, I was also uh, representing Colombia in many international agreements, uh, including World Heritage and, and, and other uh, conventions. So that was in the 90s. Uh, and then uh, I, I was recruited in IUCN at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, where I worked uh, as, as the lead for biodiversity and then as the head of global policy. So I was coordinating all the policy work of the, of the union. And at one point, after some years, I, I wanted to change my direction and I moved to the humanitarian uh, poverty uh, alleviation and gender space, uh, working in care, uh, which is a humanitarian organization where I was coordinating all the international policy work. And it was fantastic because, you know, having worked in conservation in Colombia, you, you know that the connection with people and with social issues, with equity is absolutely essential for conservation and for development, for prosperity, for well-being. So it was fa a fantastic uh, experience where I was working in, in, another, in another environment, uh, with another community. And, and then I was recruited to come back to the environment in this position as Secretary General. And, and it, was, it was really great to, to come back you know, like to the environment with the, the richness you know, of having worked on the social development and most you know, basic needs issues that define everything that we work. And, and somehow it's, it's, it's closing the circle uh, because uh, I was remembering that when I started working in, in, in the Inderena you know, a long time ago, uh, it was the time um, the director of Inderena was Margarita Marino de Botero, and she was a member of the Brundtland Brut Commission. So she was coming from all that, you know, and I think that I started my career already thinking about, you know, the international world, what was happening in this defining moment. Um, and then when I was working in protected terrors and I was in the negotiations, it was the 90s, so it was just before Rio. And then, you know, like coming here, all the circle, you know, going through the development of the CBD, uh, the SDGs, and then coming here is somehow closing the, the circle between being uh, working at the local level and then working in international policy. So that's me. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Indeed, there are all these concentric circles that we, that we have been, we are part of. And it's wonderful now to, to see young people joining these uh, efforts. And uh, as, uh, as you know, I direct the PhD program in global governance and human security at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And indeed it's with our team that uh, we started this, this effort and these dialogues to, to pay attention, not only to the institutions, which is what we study, but also to the individuals that make these institutions. So it's wonderful to hear your, your, personal, your personal story. And remember, this is the Secretary General of the Convention. So let's turn to the convention a little bit now, to, to the institution that you are leading. And uh, just before I, I start with, with a few questions for you, I want to, um, remind our participants that uh, you can engage in the in the conversation please put Q, uh, questions in the Q&A box and I will pull them up and in, insert in in this dialogue this is an informal conversation we want to explore various issues so please put in put in any questions you have in the Q&A box and uh, I'll pull out as many as possible throughout the conversation 
So let's start with the with the Ramsar Convention on, on Wetlands. It is one of the oldest conventions in, in the system, or maybe the oldest convention in the system of multilateral environmental agreements that we celebrate the beginning of the global environmental governance system in the 1970s. And indeed, Ramsar was created even, or it was negotiated and signed even before the creation of, of UNEP. And uh, you are celebrating 50 years this year of the Ramsar Convention. So tell us a little bit about the, the process of how was the convention negotiated? Why wetlands? Why do they matter globally? And uh, why is it important to have such, such an instrument to protect them? Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting in terms of the thinking of governance in the 70s, because there was it was a moment of increased awareness about the environment, what was being degraded. Uh, and part of that was this thinking about this particular ecosystem. Uh, and it started with uh, ornithologists, with people who were interested in birds, in waterfall, uh, in, 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 you know, water birds. Uh, and seeing the decline uh, of these ecosystems and the impact that this had on birds. Uh, so they started the process by looking at, you know, like, you know, the interest in, in this particular kind of animals. But then they moved to looking at the ecosystem. You know, we need to conserve the habitats. And within, you know, like the discussions that they had, because the, the convention was signed in 1971, but the negotiations started almost 10 years before. You know, it was all this, this, this thinking about how to, to conserve this particular habitat. And while, while the concept was being developed, uh, it very early, they came with the idea also that wise use, what they call uh, as wise use, which is sustainable use, was an important part of the equation, that this ecosystem needed to be protected through you know, a network of protected areas, but that it was important to ensure that all the wetlands uh, were going to, to be managed in a way that was sustainable and that included people using the ecosystem. So, so this is how, you know, like some interested people uh, uh, started uh, with uh, this awareness raising. And then uh, in 1971, uh, 18 governments uh, signed the convention. It was, that was the first international agreement looking at a global framework for the conservation of nature. So in that respect, I think that it was very close to the, of course, one year before Stockholm and the creation of UNEP, but I think that it was part of, of this thinking uh, of, you know, the need to, to conserve uh, uh, nature and to, to avoid, you know, the degradation that was becoming very, very important. And, and you know, it was a time where wetlands uh, were, were seen uh, for, for many centuries, you know, as places that needed to be civilized, that needed to be converted. Uh, but at the same time, especially in the, in the developed countries, they started to see that by draining all these ecosystems, they were having impacts on the water availability. Uh, they were having uh, dry, you know, like uh, uh, lands that before were productive areas. So that created this idea that conservation and wise use needed to be part of the same equation. And, and what is interesting, and perhaps I, I will close it in that this question is that at the same time, you know, it was pioneering because it was the first of these global agreements. But at the same time, it's very interesting to see, and all this is a reflection as we are celebrating 50 years, that at that moment, you know, it was 1971, they came, you know, like this, this pioneer people, they came with the idea of networks of protected areas and the concept of wise use, which at the end is what, you know, was then reflected in all the agreements that came after that, and then in national law. So in that respect, I think that it was a, it was a convention that had, was looking beyond concepts that were going to be articulated later on in Rio and beyond. This is really- so you, Sorry, you asked me also, Maria, why this ecosystem? Well, this ecosystem is, is very particular because as I was saying, the values uh, are, have not been recognized for many years, but at the same time, when we think about the big civilizations like Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. like Macedonia, like the Delta of, of, uh, of the Nile River in Egypt, uh, Mexico, you know, all these big civilizations uh, appeared and, and developed in or, you know, in the, 
immediate proximity of wetlands, uh, because these are ecosystems that are very rich in biodiversity. So 40% of the species live or breathe in wetlands. Uh, they are also very important in terms of water, of water availability, in terms of regulating the flows of water. They are very important in terms of climate change. They are the most efficient carbon store. Uh, and they're very important for food production. So the services are, are, are well beyond, you know, like this initial idea of water birds. And the convention has evolved uh, in terms of looking at the need to protect these ecosystems, which are very valuable. But at the same time, they are the most endangered ecosystem today. We have lost 87% of wetlands. Uh, and thus, uh, we, are we are losing them at three times faster than forest. So it's the most endangered, it's incredibly valuable. So this is what makes the convention so relevant. This is, is really fascinating. Thank you so much, Martha. And indeed, we have seen um, how important wetlands are as ecosystem ecosystems. And in our PhD program, one of our doctoral students is examined, he's writing his whole dissertation on, on the Ramsar Convention, Jack Whitaker, who's I believe is with us here today. Also, he can engage in the chat and, and share his, his research. Um, but what you mentioned about the wise use is a very, very interesting issue. Wise is what, what people called it at that, at that time, these pioneers that, that, you, um, that you pointed out. And the, the networks of protected areas. This is what we're saying today. We need sustainable use or wise use, and we need to connect. We need these networks. We have a different, different sense of connectivity. Indeed, this, as you know, you and I have been talking about these issues because I've been studying UNEP for uh, the past 20, 20 years and just published the book on the 50 years of UNEP and have come to the same conclusion that the people in the 70s, in the 60s and the 70s that were envisioning the institutions were pioneers. They had a vision that is valid today. And I'm seeing people are engaging in the, in the Q&A uh, space right away. And so uh, Laurent Dureux is asking exactly this. Who were these pioneers, these bird watchers that started the work of the convention? Um, and then John Scanlon has a question. But uh, let's see, who were these, these pioneers that Laurent is asking about? So this convention started, first of all, and it's very interesting because that was also the case of CITES and other conventions by NGOs. So it was uh, IUCN. It was also what is now the, the, the Wetlands and, and, and Waterfall Trust in, in England. Uh, so interested people, and they started to bring in governments, uh, starting with the US, who was a con which was a country very active in terms of wetlands. I mean, the, the, the Dust Bowl, for example, in the Midwest, you know, was a call about, you know, like the importance of conserving these ecosystems. So uh, it was the US, it was Russia. The, the Dutch government was the one that wrote the first draft. So they started to, to, to get governments together. And, and initially, uh, there were some e European countries. But then uh, when the, within the 18, uh, they signed the convention, there was Iran, uh, because Ramsar is the, the, the city, the, the small city where the convention was signed. And, and, you know, the convention is known uh, with this name as, you know, the, the, the CITES convention is the Washington convention, the migratory species is the Bonn convention, this is the Ramsar convention. So the Iran government offered to host this conference. Um, there was also South Africa, India. So it was mostly Europeans, but there were also some, some uh, countries from other continents uh, who, who were involved uh, there. And, and interestingly, we are going to have an intergenerational dialogue later this week, where we are going to have as a special guest, the then delegate of Belgium, who was there. You know, it's, it's, a, it's looking at youth at the time, you know, and how these people were really moving this agenda forward, and then to have them connecting with the youth of today. So these were the pioneers uh, who started uh, this convention and managed to get it through. This is, this is very fascinating because this is exactly what I did for my study of, uh, of UNEP is connect to the people who imagined the UN Environment Program when it was not in existence yet. Like who were these people? What were they thinking? 
now many of them have have passed but i did have the chance to connect with them while they were still still uh, amongst us and get their stories and that that's why we call the untold stories so we'll move a little bit more into the governance mechanisms and then i'll i'll, I'll jump to to john scanlon's question which is about them but let's first let's first talk about um the Ramsar Convention as an instrument of governance, and uh, what what sets it aside as the way that it works with state parties? What makes it an international environmental instrument? So, can you just explain to us how it works as a multilateral environmental agreement? And then, uh, what John is asking is very related to to this question. And as uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, John Scanlon was uh, the Secretary General of the CITES Convention, and he will be with us next uh, next week. But John is asking uh, that the, the Ramsar is not administered by the United Nations; it is administered by IUCN. And uh, what are the what are the implications? Uh, should it be administered by the UN? Why or why not? Yes. So this convention. Well, first of all, you know, as you are having these discussions um, on governance uh, with uh, Akim and, and Inge, uh, I, I I think that it's really important that you are um, engaging with these conventions because these are legal treaties. And I think that that makes uh, them particular instruments uh, as you know, like frameworks where you have, in our case, 172 governments getting together to agree to share and to collaborate you know, with common goals of uh, reversing the loss of, of these important ecosystems. So, so in that respect, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting because uh, what makes you know like i think that these conventions and it's the same case of the 70s is that they are very practical and very focused and very grounded so the convention on wetlands is based you know like on commitments that parties make so when they join the convention they designate wetlands of international importance that they are also known as ramsar sites but they also agree to use wisely all the wetlands and and they also agree to collaborate you know like to achieve their goals so, so in that respect, you know, like it's a very focused and, and very, very practical convention. And what is interesting is that in many countries, the obligations of the convention become national law. So if you take, for example, Australia, they're, they're, and John is Australian, he, he, can, he can, of course, comment on that, uh, is the, in, the conserv in, the, in the Conservation and Biodiversity Protection Act, when, the when for example, they designate a Ramsar site, it becomes uh, implemented through national law. So it means, you know, like that if, for example, the ecological character, which is uh, an important concept in the convention, is threatened, there are measures that have to be taken. So it is very serious when countries establish these sites because they are reflected in national law. And the UK, Wales, Colombia, you know, there are many countries where the obligations of the convention are reflected in national law. And in the case of the UK, for example, it's even more important now as they are with Brexit, uh, the, the Natura 2000, which are the European means, you know, like to protect these areas are not applicable anymore. So the convention becomes more important uh, in, in, that, in that case. So this is at the national level, but interestingly, these obligations can also be reflected in international law. And one important, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, Maria, the, the other day, but the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the only ruling that they have made on the environment relates with obligations of the convention, where a third party was another country that was having impact on uh, a government's um, a party's uh, wetland. And the case was taken to the International uh, um, Court of Justice, and the ruling was recognizing uh, what the situation was and also uh, asking for reparation. So this means that we have seen also how the conversion is reflected on other international agreements. So in this sense, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an instrument that is reflected at the national level and can also have consequences at the international level. And in that regard, it, it, it has more teeth, you know, in, in terms of you know, being implemented and followed by, by the governments. Then we can speak, of course, on what is the mechanism of accountability, but just to, to go to, to John's uh, question, 
this convention uh, was uh, negotiated um, and it was negotiated as CITES, you know, as I mentioned, coming from outside of the UN, uh, but it is a legal instrument that is included in the list of treaties of the UN. The depository is UNESCO. So it's an international agreement like all the others. So what is the difference uh, is that the administration of the secretariat was given to IUCN. So, um, and that was the case in CITES and CITES at one point moved to UNEP. Uh, so in our case, uh, the administration is provided by, by IUCN. So uh, this, of course, uh, has a, doesn't have any implication in terms of the governance, you know, the conference of the parties, the standing committees, the same as in CITES or, or other conventions. Uh, the, the governments are represented formally, you know, with credentials. So in that respect, there is no difference. The difference is that the administration of the secretariat is done by IUCN. So of course, you know, like each arrangement has um, benefits uh, or has difficulties or challenges. Uh, I, I, of course, it's not uh, in, my, my, in my position, you know, like to say that one is better than the other. Uh, but what is interesting is that the, the, the standing committee is looking at this issue uh, as there are some implications in terms of the legal status of the secretariat and, and, and other issues, you know, like that they are exploring to ensure that the convention has uh, a secretariat that is able to, to, to work, you know, like in, in, in the context of the important um, agreements and processes that we have today. Uh, and just to close on that, uh, a good news, and I'm sure that John will, will, will be happy with that, is that uh, this uh, two months ago, after some, some work uh, in the middle of the pandemics and delayed by the pandemics, uh, the UN General Assembly recognized the 2nd of February as World Wetlands Day. Uh, and, and this is really an important step, you know, like for, for the parties. And this came from a resolution of, of our COP because it's bringing the theme and the, the issue of wetlands into the UN General Assembly space. Uh, it's broadening, of course, the, the, the awareness, because this is a day that we were celebrating in the convention. Now it is being go going to be celebrated in the UN. So this makes, you know, like that these connections are, are, are stronger. But as I mentioned, and, and, and we can explore that afterwards, the convention and the secretariat is member of all the, the, the coordination mechanisms that we have in the context of the UN. And the difference is really the administration of the secretariat. Excellent. Um... Let's let's talk about the countries a little bit, and and the World Wetlands Day is is very is very important indeed. Second of February, we have seen it being celebrated with uh, so much commitment and engagement and energy in countries around the world, and especially in Rwanda. We have uh, we have been to to Rwanda with uh, with our. Uh, students and uh, have seen the impacts on the Rujezi wetland, which is one of, uh, of the Ramsar sites, and it's actually the only Ramsar site in, in Rwanda, and we have seen the, the difference that implementing the convention has made at the national level, with the water table rising again, and then hydropower being in, in use again, with biodiversity coming back. Um, so can you speak a little bit, uh, Marta, about the impact of the convention at, at the country level, at the member state level? So what is the sustainable use of wetlands? Some examples that you think are, are useful examples from what, what you've seen as a uh, as secretary general at the country level. So I think that the Rugesi example is, is very good because it, it shows what it means, you know, like when the convention is implemented. And I have to say that um, it, it's good to share positive stories. At the end, you know, we have to do a lot more. Huh? So, but but we, we have very impressive and, and, and inspiring um, examples of how the convention can help governments on the ground. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, like, well, starting by the establishment of these Ramsar sites, uh, in many places, this really protects the ecosystems that where these, uh, these protected areas are established. And we have seen, for example, mangroves, and there is evidence of that, you know, where you see it destroyed, and when there is, you know, like a Ramsar site, then it is protected. Of course, it is a commitment by the governments, uh, but I think that how, how it looks is, as you were mentioning in this case, 
is that the establishment of the, of the Ramsar site creates awareness, creates commitment, creates ways of looking for solutions when there are threats uh, that allow and help, you know, like the government in protecting these ecosystems. And I think that it's, um, it's, it can be interesting perhaps to look also at some particular mechanisms that the convention has that, that are very, very helpful for, for contracting parties. And I have had the opportunity of, of seeing it myself. And it's that the commitment of, of designated the Ramsar site is not just to create it, is that the countries have to report every three years on the status of their sites. And I mentioned before the ecological character. So what, what the countries agreed was that when there is a threat or there is an actual impact on the ecological character of the site, they have to report. And they have to report means, you know, like and then they have to inform the secretariat and uh, then it is in the report, it goes to the standing committee. So there is a peer review mechanism that on the one hand side, you know, like allows, you know, like the countries to see where there are problems, but also to find ways, you know, like to, to seek solutions. And the convention has a, a mechanism that is, is very interesting is that when this happens, the government can ask for a mission to help them resolve the problem. And the secretariat manages, it's called Ramsar Advisory Missions. Uh, and these are expert, an expert group, uh, independent, neutral, that goes and assesses what is happening with the ecological character. And they help the government to find ways to help in, in, in dealing with these, these, uh, these problems. And, and their example, for example, another one is in Cabo Pulmo in Mexico, where a wetland was threatened with the uh, urban development. The government asked for, for, so they reported on the threat on the ecological character. The secretariat organized this mission and by, by bringing this information, the government was able to reassess its decision and decided not to go ahead and conserve the site. Uh, the other interesting part is that uh, these missions also involve other stakeholders. And, and I was myself, for example, in, in, in my own country, I was invited to, uh, just after the, the, the visit was done by the experts, uh, and it was a, a very nice and, and very important and very threatened wetland, which is the Cienaga the, the Grande Santa Marta. And there was a huge mobilization of civil society, of politicians around that. So the fact of doing the mission, the fact of going there, mobilize all the support. And I ended up being with the president of the Senate coming with me, you know, like to visit. And so, so it's, it's not only a technical service, it's also how to raise awareness and political will. And this of course helps also in getting funding, you know, to solve the problem. So this is an example on how, you know, like implementing the convention can help the government to find solutions. Uh, and, and I would add that the convention is also very science-based. So there are many tools that are developed, you know, like and there is technical assistance so that they can, you know, deal with the issues that they have at hand. There are two questions uh, that uh, you you kind of responded to, but I just want to to re-emphasize because you talked about the role of non-governmental actors and social movements and uh, how important that is in, in, in wetlands. And this is uh, Yelen Paronyan, who is in our master's programs in global governance and human security, is asking what is that, that role and uh, how, how can civil society, in a sense, uh, construct even more effective uh, regimes? And uh, the, there was a, a question from, from Linda Burroughs as well about uh, wetlands being damaged by a lot of projects. And uh, what does the secretariat, what does the convention have in terms of a legal weight to speak against more of this? And can you, can you see having even more weight? And I would like to modify this question a little bit because there is a difference between wetlands and then Ramsar sites as wetlands. And so what is the, the role of the secretariat in getting more and more countries to nominate wetlands to become Ramsar sites? And do you see a difference in having a greater weight when, some, when a 
when a, a wetland is a Ramsar site versus when a country has a lot of wetlands and degrading them, but they're not Ramsar sites. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, there are several questions. So first of all, uh, on civil society, well, the, conv the conversion started, you know, like through a movement of civil society. And, and, and one feature that is very interesting in terms of international governance is that the parties, you know, you know how governments are, you know, so sometimes they're very exclusive in terms of how they want to, to manage the convention and, and ours are as well. But they uh, identified and recognized six organizations as international organization partners. Uh, and that's, you know, like the big uh, civil society organizations like IUCN, WWF, uh, BirdLife International. So, so there is, you know, like a privileged collaboration with these organizations in terms of the science, in terms of the organizations that have programs on the ground so they help us, for example, manage regional initiatives. So, so there is a connection that is formalized in, in terms of the, of the governance of the convention. But then at the national level, the, the engagement of civil society is also very strong. Uh, as I mentioned also because of the wise use, the community, uh, local communities, indigenous people's aspects are very, very important. So it's a convention where the engagement of civil society is, is, is really important. And just you know, like to, to, to add the civil society uh, ingredient to what I just described, when the government reports on threats uh, to the ecological character, a third party can also contact the secretariat to say, you know, we are witnessing, with, witnessing uh, this threat. And then we contact the government and there is a way also to provide the space for civil society to, to bring issues of concern. Uh, that then are, are, are then considered uh, by, by parties. Uh, so, so this is in terms of civil society. Now, in terms of, of the weight uh, between, you know, Ramsar sites and wetlands uh, and all the wetlands. I mean, we are, we are considering the most threatened ecosystem today. So we have only around 10% of the initial uh, extent of, of wetlands. So protecting and using sustainably these ecosystems is important throughout the country. Now there are some sites that have particular values that make them, you know, like important uh, from an international perspective as well. So it's, it's a balance between the two. And of course, one thing is designation, but we also need to help in getting efficient management of these sites that have been uh, designated. So you see countries that take different strategies. Uh, you have some like Mexico that decided to reinforce their own protected areas, to use the international categories like World Heritage or Ramsar site, you know, like in a, in a way that was perhaps more or stronger than in other countries. So I think there is a matter of a balance between the two. And the role of the secretariat, the role of the secretariat is to support the designation. Uh, it, there is a process of designation where there are some specific criteria so there is a dialogue between the country and the secretariat in terms of ensuring that the criteria are met, ensuring that the information is there. Uh, so it's really a, a supporting uh, work from that the, the, the secretariat does. Uh, there is another element, which is that the countries are also committed to, to doing inventories. And this has become a main priority because, uh, and, and, and here, you know, you mentioned in your book that what is measured is managed. So, it's what do we have, how do we measure, and this is something where the secretariat is involved and that helps the parties also identify what are the wetlands that they need to focus their attention to. I'd like to pick up on these advisory missions because they seem quite, quite critical in, in the measurement, in the management, in, in getting the scientific and technical assistance to, to, to the countries. Do other uh, conventions have similar advisory missions mandates? And uh, this makes me think, Marta, does, does UNEP do anything similar or should it as the, um, what I call the anchor institution for the, for the global environment? Or is this a particular Ramsar um, element? I, I find it quite, quite interesting and this would be a, a good topic for, for a uh, scholarly paper. Uh, so the World Heritage Convention also has this mechanism, um, perhaps not exactly with the same, ter same terms. And actually we have done 
joint missions with the World Heritage because some of our Ramsar sites are also uh, World Heritage sites. And, and that's a connection, you know, that we have with World Heritage where we, you know, we identify we, which are these particular spaces and how can we, you know, like also collaborate, you know, to join efforts. Uh, so UNEP, actually, we have worked with UNEP in some of these, of these uh, missions. And, and I was thinking about one that was very interesting because it was on the marshes between Iran and Iraq, Mesopotamia, you know. And actually UNEP helped us because of course there were issues of, of presence on the ground, of political issues uh, that needed to be dealt with. Uh, but it was a great example of collaboration uh, in, in a conflict prone area where the environment was uh, the glue, you know, like to get collaboration and dialogue between between countries. So we collaborate with UNEP in some of these missions, but they are they don't have this type of mechanism, but they have been an important partner as well. I I'm going to research this mechanism a little bit more and see if if this should become a governance feature in uh, in several multilateral institutions uh, that countries can call for these advisory missions it would be a really interesting interesting issue to to explore and see how do you how do you do it where did it come from and and who should be doing and i can see martha this network of that was envisioned in the beginning the network of protected areas that we could we could even have a network of these uh, global environmental institutions do advisory missions to, to countries on um, ecological questions of trans, not only transboundary, but also transdisciplinary character. Um, on, let me just turn again to the questions. Laurent Dureux has another question, and uh, he says, uh, we know how difficult it is to communicate scientific assessment of ecological risk of, uh, of any kind. You have a long experience. Would you please share how you handle this communication with high level decision makers and how these discussion is evolving? Yeah, so I think that what Law mentioned also is this role of science and how to make science you know, like relevant for decision making. And, and that has been an important area in, in, in the work. And, and it's been actually a focus also while, while I've been here uh, because the convention has a panel uh, of experts. Some of them also coming from civil society, from academia, Maria, I mean, your field. And, and it's very interesting because it's how can this knowledge become knowledge that influences decisions. And that's always a challenge. And so, I mean, being myself a scientist, uh, you know, in the background of my history, um, it, it is very often that when a scientific report is, is, is developed, it's very technical and it's only, you know, like usable for the scientists themselves. So we have done a lot of effort in helping, you know, like these scientists develop science that is, what is the target audience and how can we get, you know, like some messages from there that are important for decision making. And we had a very good example with the first Global Wetlands Outlook that we did in 2018. And it was a great, a great product. It was the first time the status of the wetlands of the world, and it was done by the STIP with other experts. And it was very interesting because we really work with them from very early in the process in what is it that is going to end up as a technical document for scientists and managers and what are the messages that we can distill that can help in decision making? And it was really important because it was for influencing policy, but also for uh, it giving, uh, you know, raising awareness in the public. And, and actually, they came out with these messages that we came out with these messages that included, you know, like the value of the ecosystems, how threatened they are, and people don't know this. So it's how to bring these, you know, like evidence to influence decision making. And I think that this has been very important in terms of making the linkages, uh, because we haven't talked about that, but the convention, you know, like has, has been working for 50 years, uh, but it has been opening, you know, like to connecting with other agendas. And when you see the role that wetlands can play in climate change, in terms of being the most effective carbon store. So take peatlands, you know, peatlands cover 3% of the, of the land area. And they have more carbon that, that 
twice as much as much carbon than all the forests in the world. So th th these are like you know hot spots of mitigation. So how can we bring this science and then use it for decision making? So this is the type of science that we are now bringing, for example, in the context of how to include wetlands in the nationally determined contributions that countries are doing to meet their, their goals on climate change. So how can we unify or make that these agendas connect so that wetlands are seen not only by the experts, you know, like all of us who love wetlands, but those other parts of society who are either, you know, like threatening wetlands or are looking for solutions that can be a win-win for nature and for climate change nature and water, nature and food. And this is the science you know, like that I think is really important to translate in the kind of decision making that we need to really reverse the loss of this ecosystem. A question that came in a little bit earlier as we were preparing for this uh, from Yolanda Kakabadze, who was the, the former uh, president of uh, WWF. Uh, points to, to these issues that, that you were just expressing, this interconnection among the various environmental uh, areas. And she says, how much has awareness risen on the importance of wetlands uh, to threatening, or after several years of threatening climatic events? So that connection between climate and wetlands and how can decision makers gain greater awareness of their importance? Absolutely. So, and it's good to hear from Yolanda. I also know her for many, many years. She was also the president of IUCN before WWF. So uh, good to hear from her. Um, so yes, I think that this is something that um, the parties themselves, you know, like have seen as, a, as an important opportunity to show these, these, these links. And they have uh, the COPs, the last COP uh, came out with resolutions on peatlands, on blue carbon, with the, with the idea of showing the importance of these ecosystems for climate change. So, and this is, you know, like on the mitigation part, but if you take the adaptation and the resilience side, side I don't know if you know, but 90% of natural disasters are water related. And you see, and there is evidence about the, the, the role that wetlands can play in avoiding floods, avoiding droughts, protecting coasts because wetlands also cover marine and coastal uh, ecosystems. So, you know, it's, it's, it makes economic sense to conserve these ecosystems and to use them wisely, you know, as part of strategies to deal with climate change, for example. So the, the progress has been in raising awareness, uh, in supporting governments to integrate wetlands in their NDCs. And we collaborated with UNDP as they were, you know, like supporting NDC processes to include wetlands in the countries where there was an opportunity for that. And we are seeing that countries slowly are starting to, to get, you know, like this connection. For example, the UK has also, as part of their, their NDCs, they have a big program of restoration of peatlands. Uh, so it's, it's getting, you know, attention. I think that we still need to do more. Uh, but it's it's really an important connection that parties are, have recognized, but that now, you know, like we have to ensure that decision makings, decision makers in the climate space are also aware of that and see the value of wetlands uh, from that perspective. And as you as you know, Martha, we have been working on creating this environmental conventions index in our Center for Governance and, and Sustainability that measures the extent to which countries implement their uh, commitments under the various conventions and uh, the uh, driver, the driving force behind it is what one of our now former doctoral student and a fellow Colombian for you, Natalia Escobar Pemberti. And I'm going to put Natalia on the spot and uh, actually ask that, that she be spotlighted and join us on, on the video. She put, Natalia put, put a question in, uh, in the chat. And now uh, I'd like Natalia to ask you that question in, uh, in person as a, as a fellow Colombian. <laughs> thank you, Maria, and thank you, Marta. It's a pleasure to to see you here and and to to follow up on on the work that you have been doing i, I ha, we had the opportunity to be at the cop in dubai in 2018 and it was very inspiring to see you explain 
the progress of the convention. So uh, thank you very much. And, and you also got me all nostalgic because when you were talking about your work for Inderena, I also remember that one of, of my very first papers and, and work that I did in college about some of these issues had to do with, with the Inderena. And we don't remember that anymore because it's moving to, into other institutions. So my question was a little bit in the sense of, First of all, like recognizing the amazing work that the Secretariat is doing with the state parties. Like, as I know, we have told you 100 times the reporting rates for the Ramsar reports, national reports, the information and the, the follow up that you do with the state parties on that regard is, is very, very interesting, a very a good case study and something that we highlight everywhere we talk about the index. But uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how the fact that the wetland is like this visible ecosystem plays a role in its protection. Like we, we have the ecosystem services that they provide, but is, is that sense of, of belonging to the communities and to the country is that important in terms of the implementation? We just saw over the weekend that Costa Rica won that Airshot Award for their protection of forest. And, and I was thinking if there's something there that, that we can connect to that process of, of protecting wetlands as well. And if there are any other valuable lessons that can be useful, of course, for Latin America, but also for, for the rest of the world. Thank you, Natalia, and it's a pleasure to, to see a fellow Colombian. <laughs> very, very good to see you, and I'm glad that you went to the COP, so you saw, you know, like the countries in action, which is always a, a very interesting experience. Um, so first of all, on reporting, I, I, I need to, to, to I have to, uh, to thank you and Maria, because it has been really important. We hear so many bad news, you know, about the destruction of the ecosystems and the conventions that don't progress and and you know it's not enough we have to do so much and it is true i don't want to 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 say that but it's it's, it's also very inspiring to to get um, results as as what you were describing that you know the the convention is is the best in reporting and we have a rate of 88 percent of reports every three years and and I know that in the last triennial it has been increasing. So so that shows, and it's a long report. Huh? Those of you who know it, uh, it really shows, you know, like that there is an interest in countries, in, in, and they take that very seriously because, as I mentioned before, it's a peer review uh, mechanism. Um, so I, 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 what what you are asking, Natalia, I think that it refers to, to to what I mentioned at the beginning in terms of this being a very grounded convention, you know, it's national, you know, implementation is at national level, there is a lot of collaboration. And it really, um, it, it's one of the things that, that I, I have had the opportunity to do that, like the most is when I can go and see what is happening on the ground in these countries, there is a level of commitment in many places, I, I would not say that in all of them, which makes a huge difference. And, and you mentioned Costa Rica, Costa Rica has been amazing, and they have really turned, you know, like, a whole dynamic of how government was looking at the environment. We have other countries championing like Uganda, you know, and, and our, our national focal point, unfortunately, passed uh, um, Paul Mafabi. And, and I was asking him, Paul, what is it, you know, that makes that Uganda is so, you know, a champion, you know, and, and doing all these wonderful things. And he said that it was really the commitment that, you know, he, they took the president to see what some of these places he was convinced of the importance of, of this ecosystem, the services, the water, that they depended on that, and they really, you know, like took action. So I think that is a combination of practical measures, what can be done, and the will, you know, like and the passion that some individuals also bring uh, to, to really create the change. Uh, but I am convinced, and, and this is really building on what the countries have been doing, that the key is to connect with other agendas. I think that we in the environmental movement and, and, and in the convention is part of that. We have been for many years, you know, like so centered in, in our own community when what we need is to engage with other communities. And of course, this is part of the governance uh, discussions that I know, Maria, you, you, you have been so involved in and the role of UNEP. And, and, and I think, you know, like that we are in, a, in an important place now with the SDGs. And this shift, you know, with the environment really became integrated into development. So it's a combination, I think, of 
national commitment, having practical measures, and at the same time connecting, you know, and showing that nature is a response to many of the challenges that we are facing today. There's another uh, team of Colombian women that stands behind the creation of the SDGs uh, with Paula yes. Caballero and uh, Patti Londonio. And uh, I am delighted to say that uh, I'm now editing a book series on the policy and practice of governance for Lynn Reinhardt Publishers. And our first book in the series will be about the creation of the SDGs by Paula Caballero and Patti Londonio. So uh, that will come out in a, in a few months, in the beginning of, uh, of next year of 2022. And so um, just looking at, uh, at the, the time, uh, okay, I'm seeing another, another question, a few more questions. However, we'll, we'll, we only have a, about three, three minutes um, but Jack Whitaker, whose work is, whose dissertation is on, on Ramsar, is asking for, are there any surprising lessons that you have seen in the implementation of uh, the Ramsar Convention in the United States? Um, so have you seen the, the United States? And then we'll, we'll come back, uh, Marta, to, to end on the leadership and then your vision for the next, the next uh, 50 years. Well, I, I would say surprising, but one very interesting point in the USA is that they are implementing for many years a zero net loss policy for wetlands. And for me, that has been really because thinking about the global biodiversity framework in which we are, of course, very much engaged, you know, because these conventions like Ramsar or CITES are implementing arms, you know, of this framework. And I think there is a great opportunity for synergies. But when, when I have heard discussions about having a target, having, you know, like, like the equivalent of the two degrees and, and, and it's interesting to see then the, in the US, the zero net loss policy is applied. So that what it means in practice is that if you destroy a wetland, well, you have to justify, you know, and then you have to compensate. So it, I have been asking a lot because one could think this, this is, they're going to destroy good wetlands and then having bad wetlands. But at the end of the day, this has resulted in overall an overall positive effect for conservation of pristine or regional wetlands, but also restoration of other places. So, so perhaps that's what the examples that I would give on the, on the USA, uh, because I think that is an interesting policy that could be scaled up in other places as well. Excellent, indeed, that, that could be a very, a very good model to and see how, how it will work in other settings. And so, um, Marta, as a last, uh, last question to, to you, what is, what is in store? What do you envision for the next 50 years of the Ramsar Convention, but also of, of UNEP? We are preparing for this next stage of Ramsar at 100, and UNEP at 100, how would you envision the leadership of these institutions in the next 50 years? Well, I think that in, 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 the, in the next 50 years, what I would expect and, and beyond is that implementation will be strengthened and that the trends that we are seeing in the environment today uh, and I think that this is something that we share with, with UNEP, and I saw Inge also commenting on that, is, you know, that this issue should be addressed. And hopefully, you know, like we would have reversed uh, the loss of wetlands and that the convention would become an instrument where, you know, the, really results in changing the trends. So to get there, I think there is a combination of, of different aspects. It's on, on the one hand side that we manage, as I mentioned before, to connect with other agendas, to raise awareness, uh, to put in place ways, you know, like to, to, to support the parties, uh, especially those that need it the most uh, so that conservation uh, can, can happen. So in terms of the, of the leadership that this requires, I think there is a combination of integration of wetlands in other agendas, as I mentioned before, is specific objectives and specific achievements in the conservation side, which we should not uh, forget. Uh, for example, we are thinking about uh, the need to restore um, peatlands in order to achieve the, the, the Paris, uh, the Paris uh, goals. Uh, so, so it's how can we, you know, have a, a combination of mainstreaming so that we don't need to say so much that we need to mainstream that it's part already of the development discourse, 
that when we are looking at climate change, we're turning you know, to conserving wetlands as well, that when we are talking about water scarcity, we are including wetlands as green infrastructure. So I, I would see a, a leadership that is on the one hand side, focusing outside, but at the same time, looking inside at what needs to be done in order to protect this particular ecosystem. And, and finally, I think that it's also a question of how can we better collaborate with others? And here I have to say that we have a very good experience of collaboration with other convention as part of the biodiversity liaison group. Uh, but I think that we need to look at, at what enables that collaboration. And I see the global biodiversity framework as, as really important for that. Because if it is a framework, not only for the CBD, but also for other conventions, as we are working with the CBD to, to make it become that, that it uses these instruments. You know, it's using these instruments to achieve common goals. So for me, the future is look at the future, but learn from the past, see what works, and scale that up so that we can, you know, get, get uh, a better world and, and more sustainable and, and equitable future. Thank you, Martha. Thank you very much. Indeed, reflecting on the past, assessing the present, naming and acclaiming the good results and moving into the future with leadership and with confidence about what, uh, what, have, uh, what we have achieved and with a stubborn optimism, as Christiana Figueres would say, about what we could achieve. Thank you very much for joining us today, Marta. This was a wonderful discussion, wonderful conversation. And uh, I'd like to uh, invite everyone to join us uh, in, uh, at the end of November or actually December 2nd, I think, uh, for a conversation with, uh, with John Scanlon, who uh, was already here today and uh, engaged with, with us, with you. Uh, John was the former uh, Secretary General of, of CITES, of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, but uh, he was uh, also in uh, UNEP as the former Principal Advisor on Policy and Program. So, uh, Marta Rojas, thank you very much for joining us today. All of the participants, we enjoyed the conversation, your active engagement. Uh, follow us on Twitter, join us on uh, during the next dialogue on December 2nd, and uh, we look forward to reimagining environmental multilateralism and taking these dialogues further. Thank you.